Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Risk Advisory Services webinar, Security, Cybersecurity Awareness, How Prepared is Your Organization, with HBK's Matthew Chavone and Bill Heaven. I will now turn it over to Matt. Hey, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Chavone. I'm a senior manager with HBK in our Risk Advisory Service practice. First, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and we hope that you, your family, your friends, everyone um, are all healthy and safe. Um, getting into today's webinar, we've regularly suggested that companies incorporate a defense in depth strategy uh, to protect them from cyber attacks. So this afternoon, we're gonna discuss one of the first offenses in protecting your organization, and that is establishing a security awareness program. A couple of housekeeping items and logistical issues. Uh, our presentation this afternoon is el eligible for one hour of CPE credit. In order to obtain that CPE credit, you will need to remain online and active during the entire session and answer all four content sensitive questions that will be included within the presentation. Uh, please request your CPE certificate by email from hbkwebinar at hbk cpa.com. Secondly, we have muted all incoming lines, but if you experience problems, please communicate with the webinar monitor through the chat window. We plan to leave approximately five to 10 minutes for question and answers at the end of the presentation, so please submit any questions to the webinar moderator through the chat window. You can do that at any time during the presentation. There is a PDF copy of the presentation available at the Meeting Control Center. And lastly, we are recording the webinar and will provide links to the recording upon your request. Please email those requests to the HBK webinar at hbkcpa.com email address. So this is our agenda for today's webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which happens to be October. Uh, cybersecurity awareness training programs, some common cybersecurity attacks, some cybersecurity, ti cybersecurity tips, and then lastly, we're going to have some wrap up um, with question and answer. Again, my name is Matt Chavone. I've been with HBK for over four years now. I help clients assess their internal controls and their information security programs via uh, various IT audits and examinations. I'm joined today by Bill Heaven, a senior manager at HBK. Bill has a dual role here. He helps out internally with some IT security initiatives, and he also has some external client-facing responsibilities. So getting into Cybersecurity Awareness Month, a little background. Again, it is October. 17 years ago, the Department of Homeland Security declared October the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month um, to create awareness around the importance of cybersecurity across our nation. Kind of uh, crazy to think that that was 17 years ago. Uh, this effort is now co-led by the National Cybersecurity Alliance and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency. Getting into some of the top cybersecurity risks in 2020, we are looking at um, two that I want to point out are phishing and social, phishing and social engineering, and the third-party vulnerabilities. I think we all know somebody who has experienced some type of phishing. Uh, or social engineering incident in recent history. Um, today we're gonna to talk about some common ways to combat that and incorporate that into your security awareness program. And also, excuse me, um, third party vulnerabilities. You know, people tend to ignore their third parties 
um, thinking that everything is fine, but you know, people that you choose to do business with impact your organization greatly. They have a significant hand in your day-to-day -day operations and the security um, within your organization. So what is cybersecurity awareness training and why do we need it? Uh, security awareness training you know, will equip you and your team members with information to protect themselves and to protect the organization. One popular component of these trainings are the phishing stimulations, which again, we will get into later. But remember, it's not just about phishing. Um, we see phishing a lot. We saw it as one of the most uh, top five common risks in 2020. But what I want you to keep in mind is it's important to build a security awareness program around your biggest risk in their enti in entirety, not just focusing one such as phishing. Um, so when you're building your security awareness program, this could look different organization to organization. And that brings us to our first polling question. Hey, Matt, we got about 75%. Right. Thank you, Lori. All right, we're going to close the poll and move on to cybersecurity awareness training programs. So we're going to take a little deeper dive into awareness trainings and how it helps to achieve that defense in depth strategy. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Bill um, and kind of ask you, based upon your experience, Bill, what determines the success of awareness trainings? Thanks, Matt. Um, as you, the slide that we have up uh, up right now would um, give companies a great foundation on a successful security awareness training program. I would say that you know the, one of the most important characteristics is to get your executive management support or executive level buy-in because without that, you're just gonna be fighting uh, an upstream battle all the time. Uh, next slide, Lori. What types of trainings are typical uh, that companies you know, utilize? So, so the examples on the screen are, are what I would say would be typical, but um, you, you need to figure out what's going to work best for your company and be able to determine what's going to be received the best, what's going to work for you, and then always keep your, your material somewhat relevant and, and make sure it's fresh. Um, an example, you know, one of the things that, I, that uh, we do internally here at uh, HBK is with um, Cybersecurity Awareness Month coming up uh, in October, we we have a quote unquote cybersecurity know it all quiz. And uh, we just give a little uh, survey monkey type based quiz where we have uh, some multiple choice questions and, and get people to get themselves involved and, and participate. And then uh, we, we have a drawing. Everybody that got the highest score, you know, is entered into a drawing to win a gift card. So it's been very well received. Um, the first year we did it, we had, you know, pretty decent um, participation, but the second year, I mean, we, we more than doubled our participation and um, I'm looking to try to keep those, uh, those stats in place for this coming year. But, you know, it could be anything. You could, um, a lot of uh, training platforms give you videos that you could watch. Um, some of them are, you know, more on the humorous side. So it's, you know, you gotta find out what works for your organization, maybe a regular newsletter, um, like I said, the uh, the quiz, you know, the, it just varies. But the the key thing is to get people participating so that um, 
you know, you're gonna increase your security awareness. Uh, next slide. So with all that being said, who should you train and how often should you train them? Um, this is this is probably one of the areas that's probably misconceived uh, frequently. Um, I was I was talking with a client um, not too long ago, and they were I was suggesting that they do something on a on a monthly basis, and they said, "Are you sure we couldn't just do it annually?" And that it's I mean again, you want to do a regular cadence, and you want to keep this keep this fresh and moving along and Probably some of the one of the worst things you could do is make it too infrequent and then segregate who's who's trained and who's not trained because everybody needs to be trained and uh, you have to kind of look at it as you know you I always use the old analogy that um, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link and so if you don't train everybody on cybersecurity or make everybody aware of cybersecurity you're really um, setting yourself up for that weak link that um, could be the person that clicks on that phishing link or or lets that uh, person into the building to um, do some exterminating or or fix a copier and they're they're just there to uh, create havoc on your computer system so um, I would say just you know what the slide says a regular cadence and um, and make sure everybody gets trained uh, next slide so this is um, this is a uh, a slide of a competency model that's uh, actually it's uh, based in uh, the science of psychology. And as you can see, it's uh, four stages of competence and everybody starts out on the left-hand side of the, uh, the grid there, the uh, drawing of which is basically unconscious incompetence. And so what that translated another way, that means whatever shows up in, the, in someone's inbox they're going to click on the link. So the more that you can get people exposed to, I mean, we're just talking phishing right now, but the more you can get them exposed to phishing campaigns, you know, the more they start to get used to it, then they, they adopt that professional skepticism. And then that's what you want because you want people to be skeptical and they want, you want to be all the way on the right hand side of that model where unconsciously they are going to, um, have this competence level, i.e. skepticism, which is going to make your your organization much more secure. Uh, next slide. So again, when we, we talked earlier about the characteristics of a successful training program, uh, one of the bullet points that, that was listed was the um, metrics. So I, I apologize because this slide is a bit of a um, an eye chart and maybe I probably should have just maybe eliminated one of the things, but I thought all three topics were were very good. And it, this isn't to say that this is what you have to check on, but it's just three ideas. And the leftmost graph there, it's just that circle with basically two categories. And what that's trying to say is who did, who was a participant in our security awareness training? And it's just a little, pie chart type thing where it's like people that didn't complete the training and people that did complete the training. Then uh, a second possible metric would be phishing exercises and you tracking, it's just basically tracking three categories on who clicked on the links, who reported the links, who did nothing with the links. And it's just the same population of like 460 some people. And it's, you see from month one to month two, you got a lot less people clicking on it and you had more people reporting it to security. So, you know, that, that's an interesting metric there. And then this last metric is just who, who locks their workstation when they leave their desk or their work area. Um, the previous company that I came from, which was a publicly, tra publicly traded company, I had this one gentleman that worked for me that was just a, a pain in my backside because if I would leave my desk, he would, and I forget to lock my workstation. When I come back from using the restroom or getting a cup of coffee or whatever it was, I'd have this little note in my Windows notepad that said, hey, you forgot to lock your workstation. You're, uh, you're lucky I didn't decide to send an email to the CEO um, based on what you were 
you know, some of your comments, you were thinking about, the, you know, the recent stock performance. And I'm going like, you know, he was just doing it to be funny, but he really, you know, got me thinking about it. And I'm thinking, so now, I mean, I, I think I'm probably about 98% sure that when I leave my workstation, I lock my, lock my desktop. And that's, you know, it seems like a pretty trivial thing, but like I described earlier, if somebody, somebody comes in the door, you know, sneaks in, you know, with, behind one of your employees and they say that they're the copier repairman or they're there to do extermination and they're just, they kind of blend in and they, next thing you know, they pop down at somebody's workstation and it's, they forgot to lock the workstation and all of a sudden they're, you know, trouncing through your network and looking, looking for stuff to, uh, to take over. So it's, um, it, these are just three possible metrics that you could use, but, um, you, you may think that this is far-fetched, but this, this kind of stuff happens all the time. Uh, next slide. I think this is our, uh, our next polling question. So. Okay, Bill, I'm going to get ready to close the poll. Okay. All right, I think, uh, go ahead, Larry, and go to the next slide. I think that's, that's for, for Matt. All right, Bill. Um, I think it would be beneficial to describe some of the common cybersecurity attack vectors in use by hackers and malicious actors today so that you know organizations can create better awareness around those those common vectors okay yeah um certainly matt um so the common attacks are out there and it's um so one of the things that and we're going to talk about that in a, in a slide or two but um one of the things you want to make sure you you do is figure out how to better protect yourself online. Um, one of the first things you can do is make sure your network is secure. So as far as your wireless router, um, I mean, I can't stress this enough, and this is, um, I'm probably gonna say this a number of times over the uh, presentation, because it all comes back to a, a common phrase that, that probably gets a little bit overused, but it's, it's very, um, very relevant is, you know, you got to do this, do these cyber hygiene things correctly. And uh, one of the first things is make sure you change your default, your factory default passwords. Um, I think companies generally are getting a lot better at this, but but there there's lists that people provide, hackers provide out online that says like, if you have a XYZ device, here's the default password. And when people don't change those default passwords, they um, and they just open themselves up for, um, you know, just people walking right into their system, so to speak. So make sure you do that. Um, wireless routing, router points. Um, if you, there's a, it's called an SSID for the, the name of your, your uh, wireless access point. And you don't have to name that like XYZ company. You can make it something very obscure, like, um, for some reason, IT people like to name their servers after the planets. So it could be something like that where you could have like a, a Pluto network or maybe the uh, computer room is next to the um, the big conference room. So you could call the, the uh, wireless network the big conference room. Just so you don't want to draw attention to yourself because uh, especially in the big cities, people drive around looking, you know, with a, a 
computer in their car and they're looking for wireless access points to try to figure out who they're going to attack next. And if it's like, you know, somebody is really out to get, you know, ABC big company and you have a wireless access point out there that's telling people to do that, then that's, that's going to draw some attention to yourself. Um, if you, if you connect it, protect it, you know, the big things to think about there are antivirus. You know, I, I feel like I say this a lot too, but make sure you have antivirus running and make sure that it's going to all your endpoints and, and your employees aren't turning off the antivirus update because, you know, we let's face it, we've all heard it. I didn't, I disabled the antivirus because it made my computer run too slow. So, you know, that's, you got to figure out a different uh, solution to that to let people be productive at their at their work, but uh, you don't want them disabling that uh, antivirus. Make sure you're updating your systems on a regular basis. Um, patches, you know, it's often with vulnerability. We talk about vulnerability scanning, a lot, and the the bad guys are out there scanning the uh, net. You know, they know where the vulnerabilities are, so they're just trying to find and they're running. If you're not scanning your systems, you know, that's not a guarantee that no one is scanning your systems. The bad guys could be scanning the systems and looking for vulnerabilities so that they can find an easy way in. So it's like the, um, again, it's cyber hygiene, it's blocking and tackling, it's, it's the basics that we have to get better at. And, and when you, whenever you can use multi-factor authentication. So if you have the ability to do multi-factor authentication, you know, take advantage of that. It's uh, it's really a great secondary uh, protection for you. Uh, next slide. So social engineering, we talked a lot about that. You know, phishing kind of gets grouped in with social engineering, but there's there's a couple of different things. You know, pretexting could be they it could be done over the phone, it could be done in person. I talked a lot earlier about you know, the copier repairman or the, the exterminator figuring out a way how to how to um, get into your, your business and then just, so a pretext is really just a, a quasi script where it's not a script verbatim, but they just wanna have, a, they do enough research to figure out enough about your company online or some of your employees. And so they have just some things that they can talk about when they get in the building to make it look like they belong there. And then they're, they're looking for that workstation that I talked about earlier where somebody left it and then they didn't do the, uh, the lock to uh, protect the workstation. And it's maybe they work over in the corner and it's kind of dark over there and somebody could just sneak in there and, and um, you know, start looking around to see what they might be able to find out. Um, tailgating is just what it sounds like. It's... Um, Obviously, if you're a very small organization, maybe you don't have to, uh, to worry about tailgating as much because you you know who's going to be in the building. But if it's a larger company, it's pretty easy to, you know, seems like every company has a group of people that have to go out and, and catch a, a cigarette during break time. And it's like you just watch those people go back in and you kind of blend in and just follow them through the door and, and you're uh, you're off and running. Um, let's see. And then baiting is just, that's more of a phishing type thing where, where people are, um, looking to, you know, they, they want to get something for clicking on a link. So maybe it's a free movie. Maybe it's a free da music download. It's just, it's kind of like you know, there's some type of reward if you click on a link and then usually you don't get the reward, you just get the bad thing that happens. Um, okay, next slide. All right, so then this is uh, specifically about phishing type uh, things and, and there, there's three versions of phishing and everybody just, you know, they're starting to be pretty well aware of phishing which is, you know, like what I just talked about in the baiting where they, they put some kind of link and, um, and typically through email. But you also, it's getting to be more prevalent. It's called vishing. And it's a, a spinoff because a lot of times it ends up being voicemail. So it's basically they're trying to 
scam you out of information over the phone. And that, that's often referred to as vishing. Same thing with um, every mobile phones being so popular today. Uh, smishing, which is a play on the um, SMS text message. So it's like they're, they're sending you phishing type emails over your cellular phone. And I don't know, I, I was just getting bombarded with these things back in, back in the beginning of the year, January. It's like, and they were, a lot of them seemed to be coming from Australia because they'd, they'd start off with, you know, good day, mate. How, how are you? And, um, got a, we got a free, uh, XYZ for you. You know, just click the link and it's, um, so, you know, those are just, if you hear common terms of, you know, it's just not always fishing. It could be, could be something else, but, um, that, that vishing, I mean, like I said, it's a spinoff on, um, on voicemail and you'd be surprised at the stuff that's out there. I mean, they have, they have cards that you can buy like prepaid back in back a few years back, you used to get the prepaid calling cards when long distance used to be something that, that we had here before cell phones made that go away, but you can actually buy a card that's going to allow you to do uh vishing. And you can you can spoof a phone number. You can change your voice from a male to a female. You can force things to go right to voicemail. You know, it's some some pretty clever technology that that allows you to do that type of uh, um, cyber hacking. Um, okay, next slide. And so everybody everybody always um, wonders what what a phishing email looks like. And again, it's going to be, they're going to try to get you with, it's, uh, I know this might be a little bit small, but they're going to try to get you with, you know, this is an urgent thing that you have to do. Um, so if you notice on this, I'll try to like walk you through it because it's a little smaller than I'd like it to be. But looking in the subject line, it's, um, it's got that ASAP. If you, if you can see down a little bit in the body of the thing, it's like, we require that all employees read and acknowledge the policy by the end of the day. So they're trying to, you know, stress you out a little bit and say, I got to, I got to get this thing done. And then it's, it's got a link in it. And it, you, I know you can't read this, but it's basically, um, if you hover over the link, it's got the fake website. So you want to make sure you take the time and, and look at that, be very, very cognizant of the attachments because that could be where the payload's at, where they're storing the malware. But um, again, you want to just stress this with the employees that this stuff is is used out there and you want to make them skeptical. You know, get over to that right-hand side of that, um, that uh, competency uh, model schedule. Um, and then some of the other things you can do, for those of you that might have been on our June webinar when we talked about business email compromise with uh, Damon Hacker, he was talking about you know, flagging your emails to, you know, with an external tag so that you know that even though it says it's coming from your employees and it says external, that you know that it's from a third party and that uh, you, know, you might not have to, uh, may, maybe you shouldn't click on that link because it's not who, it, who you think it's from. Uh, next slide. And then moving on to our favorite, one of our favorites, I should say, is ransomware. Um, ransomware is still prevalent out there. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Um, it hits people all the time. And it's really, um, you know, everybody talks about, hey, is your data encrypted? Is your data encrypted? Well, when you have, ran when you've been hit by ransomware, then you're, unfortunately, in this case, your data is encrypted, but you didn't encrypt it and you don't know the encryption key. So this, uh, this happens a lot. Um, I've heard of um, companies in the local area being hit with ransomware, and it, it's not um, not a fun um, experience to go through. Uh, back before the COVID um, pandemic hit, I had the opportunity to go up and uh, and attend an FBI briefing, and they talked about ransomware, and it's it's actually very interesting because the the people that are deploying the ransomware are getting to be very sophisticated. And they um, they go through things, and, and they may 
you know, along the spirit of a business email compromise, they may be on your system for a, you know, week, month before they actually deploy the ransomware. And you're in a situation where they know a lot about your business because they've been hanging out in your computer system and they've got a real good idea at how much you'll be willing to pay if they, when they put the thing on the screen that says your data has been locked and you have to pay X number of dollars in Bitcoin. And so they've, they've been hanging on your computer system in a lot of cases and they, they know that you're going to be willing to pay, you know, $20,000 versus, um, you know, fifty thousand dollars. They they have a pretty good um, idea what 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 they may be able to get out of you. But um, ransomware doesn't have to be one of the worst days of your year, you know, because there's there's some things that you can do to keep yourself uh, mitigate your risk against ransomware. And first one is, and I've said this a number of times, but you know, keep yourself up to date on your patches, and make sure that you're doing a regular backup. And then go to the extent of making sure that that backup has has been verified or tested. Um, I've had situations not not dealing with ransomware, but dealing with regular um, client support on a computer system. And clients think that they're doing a backup, but they never bother to test it. And that you have that bad day where um, it's the computer system's been corrupted, and you say, "Well, all right, well, we'll have to go back to last night's backup." go ahead and load the backup in the computer and you do that. And then there's nothing on the tape. So that, um, you know, you, you want to ransomware is something that you may be able to avoid paying the ransom because, you know, this is a, this is a criminal that's asking you to pay ransomware. So you don't even know for sure if you give them the money, if they're truly going to unlock your data. So you can kind of avert all that and, say, well, I know I've got a good backup, so I don't have to worry about paying the ransom, but you have to know that your backup worked and you have to know that your backup's good before you, uh, you take that approach. Um, next slide. All right. Um, excellent, Bill. So moving on, can you please review some Scenarios and associated actions for some cybersecurity tips. Certainly can. Um, so, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna go through some of these uh, these uh, tips that basically you can look at it as, as something you can do at home to keep your your personal system safe. Or it's something that you should be doing at work to keep your work system safe. And, and one of the first things to do is yeah. If you've got work information, you know, if, you're, if your organization hasn't taken the time to classify data to help you out to say, like, this is confidential or this is public or you know, this is what you can do, what you can't do, um, just treat everything as if it was your own, if it was personal information. Um, we'll get into more password um, suggestions later on, but don't, don't make passwords easy to guess. Again, patch your systems. Uh, Social media is a gold mine for for hackers to go through and and try to figure out stuff about yourself or your business. And you don't have to put everything out there. I, I, I still remember a, a presentation I did a few years back where I should go out and try to find this because I'm sure I'm sure it's uh, it's out there because I'm guessing a lot of people use it in their presentations. But um, especially a lot of like people younger, like my daughter's age that, you know, they think it's just the more you put out there on social media, the better. I had this example of somebody that was as a young person got their first credit card. So what did they do? They took a selfie with their credit card and posted it online. And you could zoom in on the credit card and you can get this person's credit card number. And, you know, the, at least she didn't show the front and the back. So you can get the CVV number, but, um, she went out there and you could actually see this person's credit card and she basically gave you the number. So, I mean, not every place asks you for a CVV. So sure that that credit card wasn't very good for very long because probably had to get shut down because of fraud. Um, and then keep in mind, we've, we've said this before, but it only takes, only takes one time to be a victim of a, you know, cyber, cyber hack. 
So, um, again, they only need to be right one time. You need to be right every time. So, so um, make sure that your employees are aware and that they're uh, they're doing things the right way and, and increasing your uh, cybersecurity posture. Uh, next slide. So when you're when you're traveling, um, basically before you go, make sure you back up your information. It's always good in case you get hit with some kind of virus. Um, again, make sure your systems are patched. If it's at all possible, turn on MFA. When you're out out and about during your trip, you, you might want to change your, your connections on your devices, especially your phone. Um, if you're not using Bluetooth or you don't want to automatically connect, because, I mean, keep in mind, like I talked before about the um, wireless access points, so it's very easy to establish a wireless access point. And so a lot of, say, for example, you're out of town, you're going to a conference. It's pretty easy for a, a hacker to get get into a hotel where there's a conference, you know, Again, I'm um, talking pre-COVID-19 uh, where we actually attended conferences. But um, so we'll be back there at some point soon. And, um, you know, they're going to be out there and they're going to be trying to do that kind of stuff. And they'll uh, just spin up a, a um, wireless access point. And if you're doing auto connecting, you maybe your, your computer's going to just grab that access point and all of a sudden you're on the bad guy's network. And it just says that it's um, instead of saying bad guys network, it says like uh, conference um, conference access point. So you don't you know you didn't pay attention to say what was the um, wireless access point that they talked about during right before the keynote speaker went, and you know all of a sudden you're in you're in um, trouble. And, uh, you know, be cautious about using public Wi-Fi, especially if you have to use it. You know, make sure you're you're running through your corporate VPN to uh, protect your data. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is can pick up some because this is uh, a lot of this Internet of Things. You know, make sure again, sound like a broken record. You know, patch your you know your device. Make sure you keep up to date on um, security patches. Change the default passwords. If it has if it has a, an accompanying app with your smartphone, you know, don't just accept all the defaults and let it do whatever it wants as far as your permissions. I mean, keep in mind when they when they set that application up to auto install, they they configure what defaults they want to be active, and they um they are just doing what they want you to choose. But you don't have to give apps access to everything, so be a little bit uh, skeptical and. Um, you know, believe me, if you if you turn it off and if something else doesn't work the way you want to do, it's pretty easy to go back and turn it on. You don't have to just automatically um, give give the developer the world. Uh, next slide. And then one of my favorite things is uh, multi-factor authentication. So if you can turn it on, use it. it it's really uh, it's really a great thing. So just real quickly here on how, how multi-factor works if, if, for those of you that aren't aware of it. So you have basically three categories. You've got something you know, something you have, or something that you are. And multi-factor authentication is typically, you know, sometimes referred to as dual factor, but the each of those three main categories, I put the subcategories of what what they um, you know what makes those up. So in order basically to do two-factor or multi-factor authentication, you have to have information from two of those categories. So again, one of the um, very first um, examples of multi-factor authentication is something that probably I would venture guess everybody in this uh, webinar today has used, and that's a bank ATM machine. You have to have, um, it would be the something you have, you have to have your ATM card. So then that, and then the second thing you have to have is something you know, which is your PIN number. So that's a, you know, a real early version of a multi-factor authentication. And, and that just increases things exponentially because now somebody doesn't just have to get you to click on that phishing email link. They have to get you to click on that link as well as 
um, follow it up with your two-factor or multi-factor authentication, which is going to make you a lot more secure. And there's a, if you haven't heard of it, there's a great website out there um, for, it's called um, twofactorauth.org. It's uh, two spelled out, T-W-O, factor, and then A-U-T-H dot org. And that's a real cool website that you can go out and it's got all these different categories like banking. And so you can go out and see if there's a entity that you're planning to do business with to see if they require two-factor authentication or they have that opportunity for you to use it. And you can um, actually, it, I think it has a place where you can um, request that if somebody isn't using two-factor authentication, you can ask them, you know, what are their plans for using it? And they'll, they'll respond back to you. It's just, so it's a real um, information, good information website to, uh, to have. So if you haven't heard of that, you can try that out. It's a, it's a good thing to have. But um, I, I stress using this all the time because it gives you that extra layer of security. I've even actually convinced my wife and daughter that it's a good thing, you know, because they, at first they were upset with me because I turned it on on all my bank accounts. And then it's like, you know, I can't do I can't do my online banking as fast as I used to because you got that that stupid uh, multi-factor turned on. But um, just you know, don't don't give in to the uh, the popular uh, viewpoints and just understand that it's giving you an extra layer of security. Um, next slide. I think we have another poll question. Okay, Bill, I'm going to close the poll. Okay, thanks, Lori. Um, go ahead and uh, give me the next slide. So um, we're starting to get a little short on time. So I'll, again, you have, like Matt said, you have the, you can download the presentation from the uh, Media Control Center. But um, you know, so you've got two slides here of password um, tips. And again, don't get hung up on password. I mean, it could be a phrase. Make it something long, as long as possible. Um, you know, get creative. You can, um, you can, like if um, if your password was going to be um, frog, you know, and again, not I'm not too. I want you to get a long password, not a short password. But um, you know, if you're gonna, you could spell it like P H R O G. You know, you can play games with you know phonetic sounds. You can swap out numbers for letters to make things a little more difficult. Um, don't reveal your password to anyone. I mean, no one should ever be asking you for your password. And certainly the IRS isn't going to send you an email and ask you for your password. Or, you know, Microsoft isn't going to, or your own help desk isn't going to call you and ask you for your password. I mean, they, your own IT department, they're, you know, they know a lot more than, um, you know, that you're ever going to really be able to understand. And they they can figure out how to get in on your system if they want to. They don't have to ask you for your password. So, you know, don't give that type of information out. Uh, next slide. Um, again, a lot of, this is an important one, unique account, unique password. Um, a lot of reasons why hackers are so successful is that, People tend to use, you know, a lot of websites, they force you to use your email address. And so that's your common user ID all over every place. And then they make, so if you go to every account, every place you do business and you have your email address as your ID, and if you use the same password 
over and over and over. You know, the, all they got to do is you know, figure out that one time and then they just try websites and say, well, I wonder if, uh, if Bill or Matt has an account at XYZ company because they, and if I'm using the same password over and over, then, you know, then that gives them the opportunity to get in, which I jump down to the bottom bullet there. Use a password manager. Password managers are great because you only have to remember one password and you can have, you know, hundreds or thousands of passwords inside that password manager and you can, you know, make it generate secure passwords yourself where, I mean, it, it's got numbers and letters and symbols and uh, it, it just increases your security exponentially. Uh, next slide. Um, phishing tips, you know, again, protect your personal information. I, I talked about the, the young person that got their first credit card and they, they want to put, you know, they put their picture of the selfie with the credit card up there. People want to give away all kinds of information. And to understand the way that linkage works is you have those security challenge questions. Number one, you don't have to answer those accurate, you know, there's nothing, there's no accuracy check. So you don't have to give true answers. You can just play a game with it. You know, it's like your your birthday. Um, like for example, I'm born in August, but when I answer all these things online, I I'd say that my birth date is January 1st because it's an easy, easy to remember. Keep the same birth year, but I don't use real information when I put in there. I I changed my mother's maiden name and I, I use that consistently, but I don't, number one, I don't put a lot of stuff out on um, social media, but I, I have my set answers when I'm, you know, filling out those challenge questions. And so no hacker, even if I did put that kind of information on Facebook, for example, they're not going to be able to go to Facebook and figure out any information about me that's going to enable them to better try to access my accounts. So it's like, you know, I got two levels of protection there because I'm not putting stuff on social media and I'm I'm not giving, I'm giving consistent but not truthful answers to some of those challenge questions. So it makes it more difficult for hackers to uh, figure out what, what's really going on with me. Again, you know, just the, the basic stuff, hover over um, different passwords, use a password manager, make sure you're using antivirus. Next slide. Um, if you're protecting your uh, phishing tips, I think did we did it flip, Lori? Um, it looks like it might be stuck. <laughs> is it just me or is it stuck? It seems like it's sticking. It's it's stuck. Hold on. Let me see if I can try it. Restarting it. No, All right. Well, I'll just I'll just keep talking here. So, um, again, we're I'll just I'll just flip through some of these. They're all in your uh, in the slide deck that when you um, when you get a chance to take a look at that after. So the next the next topic was protecting your digital home, and it's again it's just you have your own Wi-Fi network. You know, make sure you stay up to date and keep that thing patched. Make sure you change the default passwords. Um, again, protect your personal information. And if you have the opportunity to use multi-factor authentication, by all means, do that. Um, don't put your life out there on social media, though. I keep waiting for, um, what's the one, one of the favorite ones of my daughter, that if anybody's heard of Snapchat, you know, there's this image or this uh, perception out there that Snapchat is um, the, those little things they put together only last for 30 seconds. And, uh, you know, there's no delete button on social media. But, you know, people, my daughter was under the impression, well, Snapchat only lasts for 30 seconds, Dad. And I'm going, you know, Sarah, that's out there on somebody's computer system. And it, I'll, I'll do anything you want to bet that, uh, that data still is out there, even though 30 seconds has passed. And that, so I'm still waiting 
um, so far it hasn't happened. So they must have some pretty good security, but um, I've just, I have a little bet going on with my daughter that Snapchat's going to get hacked. And then you're going to find out that those 30 second uh, lifespans were uh, greatly misunderstood. Um, okay. Next slide. I think that's a, uh, that's a wrap up, Matt. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Uh, that was excellent information. So, I hope everyone found today's presentation informative uh, and worthwhile. But in summary, you know, creating and reinforcing awareness is critical. So it all starts with determining the major threats that your organization faces, and you need to educate your employees on those threats and how to prevent and detect them. So as always, we are here to answer any questions you have and help with security awareness within your organization. Uh, most notably, we can help with conducting security awareness trainings, deploying and managing phishing campaigns, and overall assessing and strengthening your security program. So we're gonna jump to today's last poll question before we get into some question and answer. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. All right, Lori, do we have any questions regarding today's presentation? We do. Um, our first question is regarding workstation security with unattended screens. Is there a way to monitor that, monitor that at home, or is that just something we should be raising awareness of? Um, I I'm not a, oh, so sorry. go ahead, Matt, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so I think, you know, it starts with obviously everything comes down to balancing and uh, reducing risk. So presumably there might be a lower risk of shoulder surfing or malicious actors jumping on unattended workstations when employees are working from home. Um, but of course, you know, the question was, you want to monitor those unattended workstations and I think it starts with being proactive. So from a technical standpoint, you can force lock screens at the group policy level, um, but more so you can implement an administrative control, whereas you educate your employees on secure work from home policies. Now, with regard to the question of monitoring uh, your employees, you know, there are many tools out there um, might scare some people to monitor employee productivity and their actions, how long their computers are idle, um, what websites they visit. So depending on how much, um, you know, your budget um, can tolerate, you know, there are tools you can use, of course, logging and, and um, other things within uh, Windows, of course, too. So there are ways to do it at what expense and what um, risk you're trying to reduce um, is something that your organization really needs to assess. Right, and you can't go wrong just, you know, doing it, making, making people more aware of the, the possibility that that exists. So I would suggest that as well, in addition to what Matt said. Okay, um, we have another question. Do you really feel that awareness training is an important part of a cybersecurity program? Um, sure, I'll take that one, Matt. I would, I would, uh, you know, uppercase my response and and say like, absolutely. Um, th this stuff, it seems a little bit um, basic at at some point, but um, if you, uh, for those of you that may have attended back in uh, July, you know, when I talked about the uh, Horizon Data Breach Incident Report. I mean, that they 
they went through the, if you remember, I went through the different industries and the fact of suggesting a control to develop or implement a cyber security awareness program, I think that was top three, 80 or 85% of the industries had that being their number one um, choice. Again, is um, you're, you're going to have certain industries that it's going to be mandated that you do um, security awareness. I know that HIPAA, so one of the thing, one of the requirements of HIPAA is that uh, you're doing a security awareness program. So you may be regu regulated into doing it. And again, it only takes one. Back to that weakest link example. So back on unconscious competence model, you want to be over to that right hand side where people are going to be skeptical and they're going to just by default, you know, think that something uh, bad could happen and, and want to, you know, make sure they're not just letting anybody in the front door or clicking on every link that's out there. Yeah, Bill, I'm, I'm going to jump in and just reiterate. I think, um, you know, you mentioned HIPAA and some other regulations. It's not just what we feel. Yes, we, we do feel that at awareness training is, a really important part of cybersecurity program, but more importantly, there are you know plenty of standards and frameworks that require it, and as Bill mentioned, regulations. So not just us, but you know the the international, the agreed upon standards of information security. You know they recognize this as a very critical part as well. Okay, um, we have what is the most common oversight or mistake by a business that negatively impacts them in a ransomware attack? And can HBK help prevent a negative event? It doesn't matter. Uh, I can jump on that real quick. I think Bill touched on it earlier with, you know, performing regular backups and testing your backups. Make sure you have something you can revert to in the event of an emergency. Um, that coupled with, you know, some awareness training, again, um, some phishing campaigns, really uh, reducing the likelihood that an employee will click on that phishing email or some kind of malicious link that would introduce that, that malicious code into, um, you know, the environment. Okay, yeah, great. Anybody... We'll do one. If, if anybody's... Um, you know, wants want some assistance on that, we can uh, certainly come in and evaluate your backup process and, and do some testing on that. It's, uh, you know, might might be some, uh, you know, very interesting exercise to go just to give you some comfort, make it, make it get easier for you to sleep at night, knowing that you're, you're not likely to be impacted by ransomware. Go ahead, Lori. I was just going to say we can probably squeeze in one more. Um, okay. Does HBK offer any services to help companies protect themselves against cyber threats discussed during today's webinar? Um, you want me to take that, Matt? Or? Sure. Yeah. All right. So, so yeah, Matt. Matt talked about it just um, when he answered that previous question. So we definitely can help you out. Um, security awareness training, phishing simulations. You know, those are some of the some of the big things uh, we talked about. We can help you evaluate your um, your backup system. Um, we we have um, you know nobody we didn't we didn't specifically call out business email compromises, but that's a that's a real big thing now. Sometimes they also refer to that as as whaling because you get uh, go for the big fish so to speak. But um, you know your the phishing awareness stuff is going to help you avert the uh, business email compromise. And, you know, you can go in there. We, we have a, a new service where we can uh, look at your control, the process of you of doing your uh, payables. We can uh, we can look at the, uh, do an analysis of your control there and, and figure out how susceptible you are to maybe falling for a business email compromise or help you strengthen your controls there to, um, Put some things into place, especially with um, a lot of people being still in a remote um, mode, so to speak. It's not as easy to just go down the hall and ask if, um, hey, did you really send me that email where you want me to wire a million dollars to an offshore account? 
you know, it's, we can help you put controls in place to maybe uh, prevent that from happening. And then, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of other stuff that we can do, but if you have any questions at all, just uh, reach out to myself or Matt, and we'd be more than happy to, uh, to assist you. All right, Thanks, great. Um, I do want to thank everybody for attending. And real quick, just mention our next webinar will be held on October 28th, uh, where Bill Heaven and I will be joined by Joe Wynn, CEO of CISO. And we will be discussing the three lines of defense and how to incorporate that model into organizations of any size. So we hope you can join us. That's again, that's Wednesday, October 28th. Thanks, everyone.